Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sean, I'm from LF in Australia. I uh, wanted to welcome you to our Academy session. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Academy is something that we do uh, at LF. Uh, we run a session the last Friday of every month. And it's our commitment to continuous learning and something that we think is a, is a great way of um, sharing knowledge and ideas. Uh, you can see a lot of our past videos on YouTube. Um, and if you like this content and you want to see more, please subscribe. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, have lots of these uh, conversations and these videos shared uh, with you. So um, I'm here in, in Melbourne, in Australia, and uh, something that we do in Australia uh, is we like to acknowledge, and I'd like to acknowledge now uh, the traditional owners of this land. So I'm in uh, Melbourne City, the traditional owners are the Wurundjeri people, so I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, their elders, uh, past, present, and emerging. And uh, I really like to thank all of you as well for taking the time to participate and to and to, to watch this uh, this presentation. So that out of the way, I wanted to start off with a, a caveat. So a little bit of an introduction to me, I guess. So this this session is about uh, brand and and brand in the advent of Web 3.0. And I want to firstly say that I'm not an expert in Web 3, uh, not even close. Uh, secondly, I also wanted to say that I'm going to present more questions than provide answers. So uh, my hope is, though, that by asking those questions, uh, we might stumble our way towards some semblance of an answer or uh, some, some knowledge or understanding. Uh, I'd like to say that I don't think anyone can really predict the future, um, so I'm not going to attempt that either. Uh, but I want to have a look at you know, what we can learn today. Um, I think there are uh, you know, some really great lessons from, from history that we can look back on. Um, I don't want to do the typical cautionary tales of you know the, the blockbuster failures, those kinds of things. I think that's all been been said before. Uh, but I, I, I want to do a little bit of navel gazing, um, uh, but I don't want to end on any sort of bold predictions or anything like that. Just a little bit of fun. Um, and, and the last thing in my intro I wanted to say is that uh, I really like listening to music, like a lot of you, I'm sure. Uh, and why I mentioned that will make a bit more sense uh, in a bit. So I wanted to go through. Uh, history lesson and not in any great detail but a quick history lesson of the internet so if we start at 1983 um, actually two years before I was born for <laughs> those who are interested um, the internet was created so aside from the introduction of global connectivity um, this was the kind of the key marker of that first incarnation of the web it was predominantly text-based so it was interesting and it was it was cool it was new um, it had a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity. Uh, and at the time, what it meant is that we were able to adapt known knowns in the way that we communicated uh, to work in this new medium. So, for example, from typing and writing letters to email, etc. Fast forward a little bit to 2004, so around 20 years or so later, and we get Web 2.0. Now, the major changes uh, for Web 2.0 being a huge increase in the amount of services and functionality, uh, or, or just to the actual use cases and utility that the web provided. Um, so these changes enable the creation of things that we use every day now. So uh, social media, for example, image sharing, search, uh, video and content streaming, and of course the rise of the app, so applications and um, that utility that applications bring with them. So uh, I, I don't think there's anybody here uh, that would be watching this, given that you're probably streaming it on YouTube, um, that isn't you know, benefiting in some way from the utility of applications in everyday life. So the interesting thing was like with Web 2.0, in the background of all that technology advancement, we also saw a really interesting um, change, a huge rise, I guess, in the social utilization. So uh, we became more connected and we became, I guess, to a degree, dependent on the internet uh, for communication, for education, work, uh, how we manage our money. And so the business of the internet boomed as well. So, you know, we gave rise to ad revenue. Uh, so, you know, people like influencers and things like paid search and, you know, what was kind of colloquially known as the eavesdropping algorithm, listening to every conversation and kind of recommending things and serving up content based on that. Um, and, you know, I guess as we became more intertwined, uh, you know, between our physical lives and our digital lives, um, we still kind of really think of the internet as being like external to us. Now, there are arguments against that when you think about people who have maybe smart assistants in the, in the speaker, like 
alerts up oh Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to trigger anybody's devices. Um, and it's you know it's I guess kind of like a digital sidebar to our mostly analog world. And so we're still kind of organic, you know, it's it's kind of like ones and zeros and we are like the salty, sour, hot, cold and, you know, all the rest human things. And, and I think that's interesting because, that, you know, there is this kind of notable separation, although it is very intertwined, which is where we are today. And if we kind of think about Web3, and this is interesting because, as I said, I'm no expert in this space, so I have a lot of curiosity as to what this is going to mean. And for me, like I'm sure uh, a lot of you, uh, the advent or the announcement of things like the metaverse and Web3 and what Web3 enables, aside from being decentralized, uh, aside from being immersive, um, you know, those things, you know, they kind of remind us of a little bit of sci-fi. <laughs> and, you know, you might have kind of jumped towards something scary or something fun like Ready Player One or The Matrix uh, but I actually thought of uh, something which I wanted to share, which is uh, there's this 2009 Bruce Willis film called Surrogates. And Surrogates, it's, um, it's an interesting look at what the future could be like. So it's dystopian, it's, it's really unnatural, and in some ways it's a bit scary. But I thought I'd take a quick side uh, bar there. So I'm just going to spend a moment talking about Surrogates because I think it did a really great job of predicting a future without getting as much, um, you know, popularity or as much recognition as some of the other more popular films. Uh, and I, I think this is kind of my favorite um, interpretation of what a possible metaverse-like future could be. It's kind of building on the um, sort of second life uh, idea. Uh, so sorry, it's, it basically tells the story of a future where society, uh, so you know, all the people in this modern future society use uh, what they call a surrogate body. So it's like a robotic Android version of yourself um, or an avatar which you can control remotely by jacking into this kind of like hyper real system that you have at home. So you kind of plug in and uh, you then live and work and party, et cetera, you know, all the kind of the real physical um, things that you do today, uh, but you're safely at home and the advanced kind of, you know, expensive, technically advanced machines are out there doing this. It's, it's kind of like protecting you from all the risks so you can, you know, do some really insane fun stuff, but um, you know, not get hurt, kind of like playing a video game. Um, the other thing that was interesting is like they really showed how people could choose who they wanted to be as well. So um, you got things like amazing strength and speed and, and beauty, stamina, and it kind of sounds pretty far-fetched. And when you watch the film, you'll see that it is pretty far-fetched. Um, but in a year like this year, there's over 3 billion people that are gaming right now, which I think is enormous. It's a... $300 billion US uh, industry and growing. And more and more, particularly if you talk to younger people, uh, we're spending time and, and money and a lot of our social cachet uh, in a kind of virtual digital world, which is not dissimilar, aside from the technology levels, uh, you know, from this kind of concept, uh, which I think is, is, is kind of cool and interesting and scary. <laughs> um, so, you know, this desire to play out a superhuman version of ourselves. Uh, you know, from the comfort and safety of home, isn't that hard to believe if you look at it through that lens. So when Mark Zuckerberg announced the launch of Meta and showcased his computer-generated avatar interfacing with the future world, my gut was like, yeah, this is kind of like the same as Second Life, uh, which I didn't really get into, or it's The Sims. So what? Uh, I'm nearly 40, as I said, and the little kind of VR gaming, AR gaming that I've done um, has never really come close to like the real experience of me driving a car fast or like jumping out of a plane and what sort of stuff. But then I have to think if I was 15 today or if I was seven, like my nephew, um, or even if I wasn't born yet, um, I'm about to be a dad, and uh, you know, my son, you know, what his life might be like. Uh, the kind of the native metaverse, uh, you know, concept is a little bit different. You know, their openness to that uh, that type of experience in that world. Um, is a really interesting thing to ponder. And you know, I, I like to be open-minded, but I'm curious and, and I guess a little bit pessimistic about how the experience can be delivered. And, and this kind of goes into brands. And I want to talk a little bit now about Meta um, specifically because I think they're you know, probably the most notable or uh, you know, one of the biggest announcements in this space. There's a lot of utility things that are happening, but when... Uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, announced the, uh, the launch of Meta and sort of showcased things. It, 
it kind of got a lot of people going, huh? <laughs> and, uh, I was one of those people. So what this means uh, for brands, and, and possibly you've heard of stories of uh, brands, you know, um, buying a large-scale advertising media in, in the metaverse and uh, a bit of a land grab or a, a rush to get property and, and kind of establish yourself in this, you know, this impending digital universe. Um, and I, I think that that's, you know, I, I wonder about, how relevant that is to the sort of the salty flesh and bone of uh, human experience. Um, is this going to be something that happens and goes away? Is this an inevitability that we're all sort of marching towards? I'm curious about that. So I wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit. And that got me thinking about my own personal experiences with brands and, um, you know, why I choose to purchase from one brand or another and whether I see an advertisement and whether that's in the real world or if that's in, the metaverse in the future. And so I wanted to kind of like go back a little bit and think about um, association. And so I wanted to stop on that sort of idea of music. So the music and, and brand relationship to me is interesting because bands and musicians, they have a brand story, you know, and, and a lot of us will attach our identity, our personal identity to a particular genre of music. And I'm sure you've all had phases where you've worn certain things or um, you know, thought a certain way even based on the music that you're into. Uh, but if I go a, a step into the sort of the technology side of it and you think about how you experience music and there's this huge, um, you know, resurgence of uh, debate around uh, artist rights and things like that with the Spotify conversations. And, and I don't want to go too much into that. I want to actually go a bit further into um, how we listen to music at a device level. So, you know, music is available to us all over the place now. And I wanted to think about, um, you know, why did I buy certain devices over others and I guess I'm a, I'm a bit into hi-fi and I quite like um, you know good quality sound and so I thought about when I was young so if I rewind now when I was uh, you know seven or eight it was pretty common for people to talk about Bose as being a good quality sound system and so I'm going to go into uh, you know a couple of uh, I guess a, a mini history lesson of brand through the lens of how I bought speakers and so brand 1.0 for me, so let's call this um, how young Sean experienced uh, what Bose was or, or um, you know, what high-end uh, music sounded like at the time. Now, it was something that, uh, you know, when I heard about Bose, uh, I was like, it's a foreign word, I don't know, uh, it's from a different place, it's from a place that has a really high uh, uh, reputation and a legacy of uh, being good quality and, and high-end and sounding amazing. And that was passed on in a, in a very different way to what it is today. So um, this was a kind of a conversational um, transmission of information. People would talk about it around me and out here, maybe my dad and his friends, uh, and then people would tell me about it. But I would also physically, you know, see the, the products. So, you know, people would have it at their home. Um, I would listen to it. And, you know, it kind of cemented in my mind that this is a really, uh, you know, the top of the pops when it comes to uh, listening to music. And, um, so at some point, uh, you know, when I was moving out of home and buying my own equipment, I, you know, didn't really need to give much thought to it. I just knew that I would buy a Bose system. And I had this kind of irrational desire to, you know, have what I thought was best because that brand reputation was reinforced in, you know, so many aspects of, of my life in my little window, you know, growing up in the Melbourne world and, then, and then my parents, etc. And I found that um, that didn't really dislodge for me in terms of brand perception uh, until much, much later in life. It's a really long-held view. And I think that for those of you who, who still know Bose or if you still uh, really uh, rate and, and buy their products, um, you, you'll agree with me, you know, that, that reputation is long-held and, you know, their products are kind of built on that. Now, I wanted to kind of fast forward. So I'm calling this brand 2.0. I don't think it's an official, uh, official moniker of um, this phase, but if I think of about Web 2.0 and the sort of the addition of social media to our lives and then social marketing influence and, um, you know, this sort of, uh, the algorithm that tells us what to think, if you want to be dystopian about it, um, it reminds me of a, a recent purchase. So, so more recently, um, I discovered a brand called Kef, which is an equally old brand, um, equally high end. Uh, the difference with Kef, though, is nobody told me about Kef. So... I think about Bose and brand 1.0, word of mouth. Um, a lot of the information was um, uh, passed on. It was kind of a, a no-known, a culturally accepted as Bose means good. 
and uh, you know if you can afford it when you when you're ready, you, you buy those and you'll be happy. Keth is a much more fringe product. A lot of people wouldn't have heard of the brand. Um, I had never heard of the brand until you know maybe a couple of years ago at, at most, and um, I hadn't actually even seen the brand um, in person. But at some point, I liked something in Instagram or. I, um, you know, stumbled onto a YouTube review or you know, somebody that was talking about the products. And I went through the cycle of, you know, seeing more and more this brand and their products. And, and I took the plunge and I, and I bought a product online, um, which, you know, I loved. And, and I've gone on to now buy several products from them. And I guess I've become a convert. And I guess now you could say I've become an advocate. But I thought it was interesting reflecting on that, that decision-making process and that brand reputation. So almost in the absence entirely of any in-person interaction, I uh, made a decision to buy, you know, a not um, inexpensive um, item and then continue to purchase from this brand. Now, at that point, I'd already experienced the product and I'd then gone on to hear them at stores and to dive a bit deeper. Uh, but what they did really well is just present in purely social media and through influences um, this ideal of, like, what it would be like to listen to music with this brand's products and how much better it would be. And uh, I couldn't I couldn't unlearn that once I had told myself that story and I needed to, you know, reward myself. With, uh, and, and the purchase, which is, I think, reflective of so many of the uh, the brands that we kind of um, interact with today and how they present themselves. And, um, you know, it's a, a really interesting uh, change. If you look at something which took many, many years to build, something that you can kind of make a decision quite quickly, uh, something that was reinforced by multiple touch points, by multiple conversations, interactions, and exposure to something that only needs a few, but a few very targeted ones. Um, and it, it made me think, well, that's today. What's it going to be like in the metaverse? You know, with all that in mind, like, how is it all going to change in kind of a more connected, um, decentralized uh, world? You know. It might be simple things like I'll pay for the next purchase with a cryptocurrency that I earned through DeFi staking. Might be that. Uh, or it might be that I will go, you know, rather than buying music or streaming music, I'll attend a, a virtual reality concert. Uh, and in that experience, I'll be exposed to new ideas, new brands. Uh, and, you know, brands will kind of do a, a, a good job of showcasing their wares to me once I'm connected in, in that way. Um, but I don't know, I, I'm not sure what the level of emotion is going to be. I think that's going to be uh, quite crucial as to how brands you know, converse and, and how they present. But I think that is, is one of my first questions. And, um, you know, how far away from where we are today in, in brand 2.0 will we get and in what time scale? And so I think um, that made me interested as to like, what are brands doing about this? Like we hear I guess some fear mongering, the FOMO kind of mentality of you need to move on uh, to Web3, you need to be thinking about this, and that's some of the questions that I wanted to raise. And I've seen recently that um, Nike, who I would say, is, is probably one of the most effective cultural marketers. They're a great brand uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, um, they historically have just been involved in so many critical moments of, of my life and of, of people of my generation's life, and now in the new generation as well. And um, so you know, Nike is a brand and this is their cultural impact and things like hip hop culture and streetwear, the Jordan sub brand that they have and, you know, the impact that that's had. And, and now the resurgence of um, some of the vintage collections in the Jordan ones and threes and the hype culture that's associated with that. Uh, and then also Converse, which is, you know, huge on its own as a brand and, and part of it. So I would say like those three brands are um, some of the most uh, impactful uh, in, in, in fashion and streetwear and culture. And they've recently acquired a, a new brand, uh, a virtual sneaker designer called RTFKT, who I'd not heard of until sort of preparing for this presentation. And to see that brand up alongside, you know, these, I guess, uh, pillars of, um, you know, modern fashion and, and, and sort of one culture is, it's really quite shocking to me. I think it's um, something that, you know, makes you really think like, this is a brand that's that doesn't make anything in the real world. It's purely virtual. Uh, and they are now on the same, you know, equal playing field uh, you know, from a perception wise as uh, Jordan, which uh, I find 
you know, it's, it's, it's confronting. And, you know, it's making me really think about, um, you know, how people are going to choose to express themselves. You know, when I was a kid, you know, it was important to have Jordans to play basketball, even though I was like four foot nothing and they had no impact on my ability to dunk. But the, the perception was there. I actually was a Reebok comp kid just for you know, historical accuracy. But the, you know, the, the message of like what those shoes and what having those shoes meant was so important. Uh, and uh, my nephew came over the other day and uh, he said to me, he goes, oh, Uncle Shawnee, I got a new skin for Fortnite. And I guarantee you that him and his friends do not care what sneakers they wear on the playground. So completely different. Um, you know, the, the Fortnite skin, this kind of virtual avatar that they spend a lot of time making is, uh, is important. The sneakers, less so. So, you know, maybe brands like Nike are, are fully aware of that generational shift and, and investing it, which is, which is, you know, cool and curious. And, and I'm interested as to what that means for uh, cultural discourse as well. So, and when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, um, it, it made a bold statement, um, it was a big statement about uh, racism and a lot of brands, including his own team, chose to distance themselves from, from those kinds of uh, political statements. So, whereas Nike doubled down and they put his face and his message um, on billboards, you know, all across the States and all across the world. And, um, you know, that's a, it, you know, an enormous uh, commitment and a bold statement. So. When a brand like that, with values like that, is then attaching itself to a, a, a trend, I guess, of virtual sneakers and, and what that means, I think that that's something that we need to pay attention to, whether or not it's for us or not. And I think that's that's a, another question I have. I then found myself kind of thinking about art. So from music, you know, through brands and you know, how brands talk to us today and how they might be talking about us in the future, and you can't think about art now and Web3 without talking about NFTs. And thinking about NFTs is another example of this kind of virtual ownership versus physical ownership and the concepts around, you know, buying artwork that, you know, is essentially a digital file that, um, you know, you don't necessarily have the same, you know, ideas or experience of provenance or, you know, a physical experience that comes with traditional art world. Um, and, to, you know, you hear these kind of shocking stories of people paying enormous amounts of money to, to acquire this virtual art, uh, NFTs, and, and, and you think, wow, that's maybe stupid? <laughs> and I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, I, I, I found myself going, I don't think I would do that. But we we'll fast forward a little bit and we start to kind of think about the idea of ownership and you know, what it means to own something and what it means to uh, prove that you own something. And, and, and NFTs as a utility and, you know, tokenization of transactions, it does move a little bit. So art is easy to get head around quickly. Uh, why someone pays something for something is, is, is always going to have a level of um, personal value and, you know, what you put value on something. And, uh, but if we move away from, you know, the kind of the, the shock stories and the, um, the, the, the headline grabbers, there are some real interesting um, real world applications of NFTs that, that are happening. And one of the most interesting ones I saw recently was uh, a property was sold uh, in the US, I think it was last week or the week before now, where um, the, the bidder um, had done all their pre-approvals and all those kind of things, but they used the property NFT and they paid in Ether for uh, a physical house uh, and that property NFT meant that the ownership and the record of that ownership was done in a matter of seconds or less. So, which is, you know, a very different experience if anybody's bought a house, um, when you're buying a home, it, it's a long process, you know, there's a lot of work to go through settlement and, and, and that was um, completely removed. So that in itself is, you know, potentially less exciting as, you know, the art world and the music world, uh, but transferring physical properties in the real world using digital currency and decentralized tokenization, um, it's a really, uh, it's a bit of a, a shift, a paradigm shift in how we think about asset ownership and, and how we want to interact. And, and what does that mean for, for brands, you know, and, and how do they coexist? Are these things interrelated? I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I find it very easy to kind of catastrophize what this might mean, uh, but also simultaneously be excited about what those opportunities could be. So I think that the, 
the the baseline of this kind of like cryptographically secure ledger that your know, digital assets can live in is really interesting, although they can be hacked. And um, you know, there's a lot of conversations at the moment about the um, the resilience required to to own these assets and to to do this well and the vulnerabilities that exist there. Um, you know, not similar to you know people breaking into your house, I guess today. So. You know, I think that um, this quote summarizes it really well. This, uh, uh, this statement from Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of um, LinkedIn and was a venture capital firm called Greylock, he said that Web 2.0 was for, for real identities and relationships. And I think that summarizes in my mind, uh, you know, the emergence of Facebook and social media and, you know, those, those things. Whereas Web 3.0 is the upgrade of the web for ownership. And I think that if you add the identity component as well and um, the decentralized nature, these new identities that you can create, I think that makes for a really interesting uh, paradigm. And it makes for a really interesting challenge, a complex challenge uh, for brands. You know, um, the opportunity for word of mouth is, is now magnified um, exponentially. Uh, and reputation you, you know, has the opportunity to spread very, very quickly or not. And, uh, you know, I think that that's going to present a whole host of interesting challenges. So one of the things that I thought if there was a takeaway and we start getting towards, you know, what does this mean for brands is what are the barriers uh, to adoption for Web3? So, you know, the technology experience in, in my mind, if I think about experiencing things, um, it needs to be good. Like we need really good utility. Like, you know, what is the value? Buying a house more quickly adds utility. Um, you know, it needs to kind of, uh, in some ways, I imagine, particularly for, the virtual world and how you experience the virtual world, deliver to your sense of self and, and complementing what in the matrix they call your residual self-image or now this enhanced avatar version of yourself. And I think that that's um, interesting. If, you know, in my avatar may still have hair. For those of you who've seen my emoji, it looks pretty much exactly like me with the beanie. And you know, does the world need to really embrace cryptocurrency and, and Web3 wallets um, is that a barrier? Like if we don't do this en masse, is that going to prevent uh, Web3 and, and, and metaverse and transacting in that world and interacting in that world? Um, is that going to stifle its, its adoption and its growth? Um, NFTs were one of the biggest buzzwords a couple of months ago. Um, now, you know, they're popular and, and, and then they're around, they're here, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, as much at the forefront of um, what we're talking about, which is we're searching for and, I think that's interesting as well. So, um, you know, these things come in waves. And so I also think about government and, you know, uh, and our financial institutions. Do they need to change? You know, if they start to adopt some of this technology and enable some of these transactions, um, will that help us, uh, you know, move, move towards it? So, yeah, I, I don't know. Is it becoming like all new world, decentralized, all indie, all improvisational jazz, kind of less structure, more freedom? Um, or, you know, are we going to just kind of box it in and uh, let it go the way of the dinosaurs? Um, yeah, so, <laughs> or if you were to be very dystopian about it, do we just get turned into batteries or blobs jacked in and consuming? <laughs> so, I wanted to take this opportunity. I think if, if I was to have a stab at navel gazing and I was to insert my personal preferences and experiences to what a possible Web3 brand um, strategy could include, I think the, the underlying principles of human experience are still going to matter above all else. I think that's the most important thing. As long as we can find a way to understand what our audience wants and needs, uh, what they're motivated by, what they're scared of, and um, use that in the way that we create things for them. If we create the right things, we create them the right way, and we're respectful of um, you know, what that audience is after and, and, and consider it, um, then I think brands will, will be okay. And, and the channel or the technology will um, you know, be used uh, in some cases very well, in some cases less so, uh, to enhance how their brand performs and you know, whether or not they will have that that continued relevance and whether or not they will resonate with, with people and get them to buy. Um, so I wanted to sort of end on a couple of questions before I go to the panel. And these are some questions that I asked about panel as well. 
And th there are more things I want you to think about, um, you know, to go, go about your life. And the first is, do we need to be thinking about Web3 now? And, and, and thinking about Web3 is one thing, but do we need to be thinking about it now is the key to that question. Is it too soon or is it irrelevant? And what does meta mean? And I mean, specifically in the context of the metaverse, what does it mean to you? Uh, what is the impending shift of um, how we experience the web or the virtual world mean to you personally? What do you think it's going to mean? Are you excited about it? Are you, are you scared? Are you indifferent? I'm curious about that as well. And what makes you buy? So now or in the future, you know, what do you think encourages you to buy from a particular brand over another or to buy or aspire to buy from uh, certain brands which you've seen or heard about or been told about? And yeah, I think that that's um, interesting. I, I, I love to think about the way that battery brands would advertise before and you know, just to come back to the, the Matrix <laughs> analogy, this, you know, the references of Copper Top in that film. And, you know, Duracell and Energizer were the dominant battery brands forever, you know, as long as I could remember, and they advertised heavily. Uh, and then Amazon brought out Alexa and their sort of own branded batteries, and, and I heard lots of people just say, oh, we just say, hey, Alexa, order batteries, and not really saying, hey, order Energizer batteries. And I'm not sure statistically what that meant for the market, but it felt to me, um, you know, at least anecdotally, that the brand was now less important. The utility and the convenience was more important. So that's another um, you know, factor, like how much of your decision making is based on accessibility, convenience, or integration with ecosystems that you're already a part of, like uh, Amazon Prime, for example. Yeah, so uh, yeah, think about you know what makes you buy one thing over another and, and where your loyalty lies when it comes to brands as well. And so that leads me to some last points around uh, how brands thrive in a web 3.0 world. And as I said, I'm gonna leave you with more questions and answers, so I'm not sure myself. Uh, but I thought this is a good place to sort of ponder and, 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 and start the conversation, because I think that's needing to happen for a lot of businesses. So I think that technology is you know, an ever-present part of our daily life. And some brands uh, are aware of that, and they have teams and, and structures and strategies that harness the capabilities of technology, and they deliver content and experiences that sort of speak to who we are and what we want, uh, but other brands uh, still may be living in a brand 1.0 world. And if you're not yet thinking about brand 2.0 or web 3.0, um, you know, maybe we need to uh, go back to those kind of fundamental human requirements and just step a little bit toward uh, brand 2.0 and then brand 3.0, whatever that would be. Uh, but I think that that's a, a conversation that, you know, it's going to depend on which businesses uh, are doing what and, and, and what services and, and, and products your brand offers. Uh, but I would ask that question, you know, where are we on that spectrum? Are we, are we still thinking like brand 1.0 and living in a web 2.0 world? Or have we caught up and are we using what's available today well? Or um, are we too consumed with what's potentially going to happen and not necessarily delivering on what we could be uh, now? So I think there's opportunity to kind of um, self-reflect as a brand owner brand market or if you're working with brands, you know, how are they going to thrive um, with all these impending things and what could they be doing now? The other thing I like to think about from a brand perspective, and, and this is a little bit sci-fi in itself, is, you know, we as, as humans, you know, are not evolving anywhere near as quickly as what technology is. And, you know, our opportunities to sort of service the various senses of uh, of consumers, uh, you know, relatively limited. You know, we mostly, the web um, in particular, is a particularly visual medium. We, we play the site. Um, in some instances, we're now seeing uh, an increase of um, the audio medium. So uh, you know, I don't think anybody would have predicted how popular podcasts have become. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to think about the, the sort of the sensory experience and, um, you know, the multitude of devices we're now connected to as well. So whether it's wearables or whether it's, um, uh, augmented reality glasses and mixed reality glasses and you know if there's a way that brands can kind of elevate the experience that they offer to remember the humans and uh, you know I think uh, brands like uh, one of my favorite brands is Aesop and they do a great job of um, catering to your sense of scent and 
uh, you know, their stores smell a certain way or their products that they gift you are sprayed with their fragrances. And um, the, the experience overall is enhanced by, by virtue of them adding that additional sense, uh, which is not easy to do, uh, particularly in a digital and predominantly digital world. But I think that that's, you know, remember the, uh, the human as much as you think about the channels and the devices. And I think that can be a good place to start. Um, now, the last one is a bit of a matter of fact, but a brand's promise, it must be clear and the products and services should live up to that brand promise. Uh, and, you know, people will talk a lot about uh, brands like Patagonia who have very clear mission statements, uh, brands like Tesla, and, and they're, you know, incredibly successful and they have a great following, you know, that people are not just customers who are buying something uh, transactionally, they're, they're buying into the overall promise of that brand. Uh, and, you know, that's not to say that every brand has to have a mission in that way, uh, but, you know, you need to ensure that what your promise is, is, is then matched by the experience, that you're delivering that experience. And uh, people will go through these phases of kind of like becoming aware and researching all the way through to, to purchasing, using, and then advocating. And that cycle, there's lots of opportunities to ensure that the experience and uh, the, the delivery of what your brand promises um, is, is strong. And uh, things like how you service customers, you know, how you provide FAQ information, warranty information, you know, all those kinds of things that are still part of that service experience and that brand experience of its whole. Yeah, I think that a brand's promise, yeah, it needs to be clear. And you know, the products and services, they, yeah, they really need to live up to whatever that promise is that you make to your consumers. So hopefully that's left you with a few things to ponder. Um, and I'm asking questions of you. I also wanted to pose similar questions and have a discussion with some people that I think are uh, quite expert and, and interesting approaching this discussion from, from different perspectives. Uh, so I want to introduce you to our panel. So I've got three panel speakers uh, joining me today. I have uh, Natalie Elizabeth, who is the Partnerships and, and Marketing Manager uh, from CoinJar. CoinJar is Australia's uh, longest running cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, I have Sean Lowe, who is the social media uh, head uh, based in Singapore for Gray, who is uh, one of the world's largest advertising agencies. And I have Tim Matheson, who is the chief technology officer of WPP uh, in AUNZ. WPP is the world's largest uh, media group and it's our parent holding company. Uh, so the first question I have, and I, I might start with you, Natalie, if that's okay, is do we need to think about Web3 now? Or is it too soon or perhaps you know, irrelevant? So with regard to Web3, I think especially over 2020 pandemic, right, we are increasingly online. You know, we attend work via Google Hangouts. So we work online, we relax online. And I think naturally that's going to kind of evolve into this idea of a metaverse uh, where our digital lives uh, just as prominent as our real life lives. Um, and so when it comes to brands thinking about a Web3 strategy, I think it's an exciting frontier, um, but ultimately it depends on the brand's objectives, their goals, whether it aligns with their strategy um, to implement a Web3 strategy. In terms of thinking about Web3, I think, to be honest, no, the, no, one's, no one knows what the hell it is right now. Right? Everyone's just trying to feel their way out. We talk about the metaverse, we talk about NFTs, crypto, kind of all blends together in a, in a sea of buzzwords. I think brands need to figure out their place in all of this. How much appetite do they have to try new things, experiment in new things, while still staying true to the core of what they are? So I think that's the most important thing. But at the same time, I think they need to be open to new ideas. They need to have a team or even agency partners who are willing to spark conversations, right? Open up those doors to say, hey, these are interesting things that happen in a space with artists, futurists, technologists, developers. And from there, what's their appetite for taking some of what's core to the brand and playing in these new spaces, be it a 3D world or creating an NFT collection or maybe even creating your own currency. I think that's, that's really interesting because it's, I guess it's one of those answers where um, we can just say it depends, <laughs> you know, for some oh, reasons. How, how bold are they to, to be able to say, hey, this is what I want to do, right? Some of them are pretty safe. Really depends on the brand as well. And is it aligned to the brand values or where they're headed to? What's on the brand's roadmap, product map? 
But I'd say that most brands are salient to what's web, that the things that are happening on Web3. Uh, are they going to be in the driver's seat or are they just going to sit back and take a wait and see attitude? I want to work with brands that are a bit more, I guess, progressive and willing to take those those risks while still being true to what, what is core to the brand value. Uh, well, I think, uh, like the other guys, it comes down to what you're talking about. So Web3, uh, you know, if you're talking about a decentralized web and this, you know, this concept of a safe, you know, de democratized, decentralized version of the internet. Um, I think we're a way off that. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I think a lot of the, the technologies that you talk about, like NFTs and, and Web3 are all based on the blockchain technologies and I think we've seen that cryptocurrencies are a good example of where blockchain technology has evolved into something you know huge really and 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 disrupted a you know a whole industry um, but to see that technology take over the the web as we know it now I I, I think that's a long way off like you know, I'm always, I'm amazed at the at the current web of the technologies that drive that were invented back in the 70s. And, you know, if you look at SMTP, if you look at HTML, TCP IP, like those technologies were invented in the 70s and the 80s, and they still are the, the foundation of the internet today. Now, to see that, you know, take another giant leap into sort of like a, a, a blockchain based technology. I, I just think the the, the the transformation that would have to happen is just so huge that I can't see that happening anytime soon. And I think the the, the infrastructure that, that so much of the internet is running on now is, is um, just so mature and, and so deeply rooted in, in the way we work. Um, I just, I just I'm just not sure. I, I, I don't understand the, the the kind of the technical concepts that people are proposing well enough to probably have a, a, a an educated discussion on it. But I I feel like what I know about what we have now is so core to everyday life. To transition that would be just such a huge undertaking. Um, it feels a long way off. But then if you look at NFTs which is, again, you know, it's a similar kind of core technology driving it. I feel like that, I feel like that's like QR codes. Like, you know, QR codes were abused by marketers for years and no one really, you know, they're on billboards and they were, you know, they were terrible. And and then when, when COVID came along and everyone, especially in Australia anyway, started scanning ev everywhere, now ask anyone, how to use a QR code and what they should be used for. Everybody knows, like it's just ubiquitous now. So I think there are areas where technology can thrive. And I think NFTs for things like, you know, contracts and transactions and, and you know, ticketing systems. And um, I think there's some really good practical applications of that technology, you know, like the proof of ownership, I, I, which I think will, eventually come down the line and it won't just be people selling the first tweet, you know. I, I think it will move into a much more practical application eventually. Um, but I think that is a long, a much more likely prospect than a decentralised web. I, I don't know how far. And then the metaverse, you know, that's a whole other. <laughs> I, 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 so, I, yeah. yeah, anyway. <laughs> Thanks. I, I hear what you're saying. I guess I probably naturally, I, I, I feel it in terms of I'm slow. And <laughs> I feel like we as people move slowly. Uh, but, then I, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that a lot of this stuff moves really fast. And I think to what Natalie was saying earlier, and I'll, and I'll come to you in a second, Natalie, on this is, you know, we are doing a lot of this stuff already. And it is kind of happening. Uh, we are living more and more of our lives online. We are giving away more and more of our data. So, I, I wonder, and I liken this advent of Web3 to 
you know, and I guess the the, the optimist in, in maybe some of what you were saying, Sean, is like, I want bold clients that want to do bold things. And, you know, that's very, you know, future forward and, and, and looking ahead at what this could be. And then maybe the pragmatist in, in you, Tim, is like, well, you know, there's a lot to be done between getting to where it wants to be and where we are today. And, you know, this took a long time to get to it. And I think that there's this kind of sense that, um, you know, and I guess and part of why I wanted to have the conversation with you is all around there's this kind of fear element that, you know, when people talk about um, Web3 or, you know, NFTs, NFTs was like the most searched term a couple of months ago and it, you know, had a huge, um, you know, blow up and there's a lot of buzz around it. And then now it's kind of like, okay, cool, we get it. There is some utility and, you know, perhaps it's, it's not as... Um, as much in the in the conversation as what it was, and, and and whether or not that will change as the utility increases or not, I'm not sure. But I guess coming back to the like question of like, do we need to be thinking about it now? I think the answer is it doesn't hurt to think about it, but do we need to be advising our clients or as brand owners doing something about it, um, or are we at risk? And I guess it's that fear element of being where some brands were, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and uh, slow to adopt and slow to uh, adapt the way that they, they talk to their customers, engage their customers um, in a Web 2.0 world. So um, I guess, yeah, it's, I can see there's some interesting uh, differences of opinion, I guess, in terms of that time scale and, and the urgency. And I guess it comes down to where the brand or, or where you sit in, in terms of like how bold you are, in terms of what the priorities are, in terms of what you're offering. Is that fair to say? I guess is that kind of a summary of what we've I think discussed? It's, um, uh, that's why I use the QR code example. I, I think NFTs are here. I just am concerned that brands will use them either inappropriately or too early in their evolution. Um, and that's why I think QR codes is a good example is, is how it was, they were used poorly early days because they weren't really understood. And it wasn't until they became part of everyday life that that, that people have really started to embrace them as to, as to their proper use case. And, I, and that's why I wonder whether NFTs, whether marketers or brands using them at the moment, whether it, it would be, they'd be used in the right context. That, that would be the risk, is that you, you don't perhaps, um, it's token or it's, you know, it's, it's gimmicky rather than something genuine. Um, but I think if you could, if you if you did happen to hit a nerve of something that was truly, you know, innovative or um, you know a great experience or hit the real utility, then it could be it could be huge for a brand. So I think the opportunity is there. You've just got to get it right. I think we had a chat the other day. I was talking about brands needing to be a bit careful when playing the space. Obviously, everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon. We've seen big brands like Nike, Adidas get in on the action. But I think the brand experience needs to translate across into the NFT space, right? I gave an example the other day where the space is a bit of a wild west. There's so much happening. There are a lot of scammers out there. Discords are getting compromised. There are hacks. There are people getting their wallets you know, hacked into NFT stolen. Um, there are bots that are being written to, to mint out a project before the actual fans can get their hands on it. And I think that if you, you're not careful of the pitfalls, uh, your brand, you might lead to a bad customer experience uh, on the end user, right? If, and true fans of the brand don't get to experience what, what was intended. And instead it's the scalpers, the flippers. I guess a real world analogy would be something like someone riding a bot to buy up all the PS5s when it hits Walmart or, or Amazon. So the same thing will happen in NFT space if you're not careful. So how can, I think as brands, when you want to do a project, you're thinking, what, what am I trying to do here? What's the best thing for the truth? How can I get it into the hands of my real fans? How do I identify it? How do I create an experience that puts it into the hands of a fan, whether it's through some sort of a uh, curated list, um, you airdrop it to people instead of making it sort of a free for all mint where you know the bots always win. So, those are just some sort of things to think about, I think, from a brand perspective. Yeah, yeah, the PS5 example is a, a real world one that, that I know a lot of people have been hurt by. So, um, yeah, that's a, it's a great way of framing it. Um, Natalie, what's, what's your thoughts? I guess it's probably slight differences of opinion, I guess, from what's been said since you spoke. Yeah, I think uh, hearkening back to um, Tim's comments about 
comparing NFTs and the metaverse to a QR code, I feel like they're quite different. Um, QR code was just a technology. It wasn't that interactive. Um, whereas I feel as though NFTs open up a new sort of channel. And I think you can kind of compare it to, you know, the early days of social media, right? Where it's like presenting an opportunity or NFTs are presenting an opportunity for brands to create, you know, branded VR and AR experiences that are immersive um, and are meaningful to their users. Um, but that said, I don't want to promise the world and talk about the future of NFTs like it's this utopia because there are a lot of pitfalls associated with NFTs and, um, you know, like Sean said, like there's a lot of cybersecurity concerns, you know, with people getting hacked, you know, discords getting hacked, um, which can really create a detrimental experience for the end user. And I suppose where I come in and part of my role at a crypto exchange is helping to build out the ecosystem in crypto. So, um, you know, it's easy for users to get onboarded with crypto and buy Ethereum and then go buy an NFT and interact with the metaverse. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a developing industry. Um, but I think there are ultimately like a lot of opportunities for brands on as long as that it aligns with their strategy um, and it's a well thought out and executed uh, strategy as well. That's great. I, I think it's great to hear that that viewpoint, considering what you do and uh, where you work as well. I think it's, it's, I guess I would say you're very much the tip of the spear in this space. Um, so the, I guess my next question, maybe we'll start and kind of build on what you're saying is around um, Metaverse. So uh, over to you again, Natalie. So what does, um, when you heard the announcement um, from Zuckerberg about the metaverse, uh, what did that mean to you? Like, what did you think that was going to change, like this kind of shift in web experience? Yeah, so it's interesting because a lot of the ethos behind Web3 um, is that it's supposed to be decentralized and very community driven. And Web2 as it stands today is... Uh, very monolithic. You've got a few behemoth companies who are controlling a lot of the like internet traffic. Um, so it's interesting when Facebook announced, you know, the rebranding to Meta and it's like transition into the NFT space. It kind of comes antithetical to the core belief behind Web3. Um, but it's interesting because it's also sparked without that announcement. A lot of brands today wouldn't be thinking about Web3 and the metaverse and what it means um, and experimenting with that. So it's also kind of inadvertently helped us as a crypto company to kind of highlight the industry as well as like all the emerging technologies that it encompasses. And I guess, Tim, you, you made some interesting points earlier around um, technology. And I guess when you talk about the, the monolithic uh, current state of the internet being AWS and Google and, you know, these kind of big players that are kind of owning and, and, and monopolizing, I guess, how we experience the web. Um, how did you feel? What do you think about that announcement and, and this change? I think it's a logical step for them. It makes sense. Um, I, I, again, I, I think it's, I think the technology's a bit off. Uh, you know, a, a bit a way off. I think it's a bit clunky still. I think some people love it. I, I personally think the best examples of this uh, in gaming, um, you look at Minecraft and Fortnite and these, I, I watch my, my kids play Minecraft and they'll, I mean, on the Xbox, they'll, they'll sit there creating their avatar. I'll spend hours creating avatars. My big, my big concern around the metaverse would be things like cyberbullying. I think, uh, you know, people, I think people behave differently online than they do face to face. And I reckon that would be, I, I think people would really bring out different personas and, and I think cyberbullying is probably the worst of it. And, and so that would be, you know, that would be the ugly side of it. Um, but it'll come, I've no doubt that the technology will catch up. If you look at 5G and the ability to stream games and, and things like this, it'll it'll get better and better. Um, will, socially, will it be adopted as wide as everyone thinks? But, you know, 
That I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you make a really interesting point about, about gaming. I, I've, I mean, my limited exposure to Fortnite has been with my seven-year-old nephew and, and during the lockdowns, being able to, I bought a Switch and bought him a Switch so we could play Fortnite. And that was really, really fun and really cool. And and then to see, you know, sort of months and months later, his adoption of like playing things like Minecraft and how immersive that experience is and, you know, the, that, that lack of conclusion. Um, it, it is interesting. And, um, and I want to ask this question of you, Sean, and I guess it's the same thing when you thought of uh, Meta, I'm sure it had an impact on you being... Uh, you know, so entrenched in, in, in social and in social media. I thought for a brief moment, I guess I was resistant, as I mentioned, but I think of social media at the moment and my consumption personally of social media as being quite passive. And I, I'm curious about um, how does socializing, or how do you imagine socializing when you think about what that passive versus active participation looks like, real world versus virtual world looks like in a metaverse um, context or yeah, and then I guess feel free to answer the original question of like what it meant to you at the time when you heard that announcement as well. Mm. Oh, that's an interesting one to ponder. I, th I think the, thinking about the brands, I think the best way that brands have managed to insert themselves in the metaverse is through existing platforms, right? The ones that Tim has talked about, Fortnite, Roblox, these are games that people are already living in. And it's no, you know, people have done brands have done a lot of interesting things in the space already. Run concerts on Roblox, um, sell virtual uh, swag through these platforms. So I think those are easy wins, um, and that's just sort of playing to where the audience live. So I think that's the best entry point I think for brands to be in. Just understand the space, who the consumers are in the space, and then being able to tailor that experience um, instead of creating something bespoke. But to come back to the social front, I mean, the metaverse is still so nascent, right? I mean, we get painted this picture in Ready Player One of this immersive VR world we, where we can live and breathe and it's like a second life type thing. But I think the reality is, as Tim said, the technology is not there yet. I think for Meta, for Facebook, for them, it seems... I think they, I'll believe it when I see it, right? So they've acquired Oculus. They've got a means for, to put people in a virtual space. They talked about creating a cryptocurrency, nothing's happened. So I think they've become a little bit, I guess they're a pretty huge beast. So it's more of a kind of wait and see. Are they gonna drive, uh, be pioneers in the, in, the, in the metaverse? I'm not sure. I think you know they're their own worst enemy. If they can do something innovative and, and change the way we live our lives, that'd be great. But um, again, I'm, I'm taking a sort of sit back, wait and see type approach. But I'm very concerned about what Tim flagged about the real world versus the online world, about cyberbullying and things like that. People do behave differently online. You look at Twitter and people are hiding behind the anonymity of, you know, a, a handle that might be, you know, avatar one, two, three, and they, they spew whatever they want. So how do you end up? I think one of the concerns that Facebook and even Twitter have to take into account is how do you create spaces that are safe for, for people? And the, the scene's changing. I think today there was news about Elon Musk pushing through his deal with Twitter, right? He wants to buy Twitter. He's going to turn it into a space for free speech. So I think if we start to build spaces for people, whether you call them the metaverse or not, we need to think about how, where does our brand fit in the space? How do people fit in the space? How do you put in ways for people to be protected? It's interesting. Um, I guess I like that you tie it back to brand because that's obviously the, the genesis of this discussion is like how do we kind of navigating this this landscape and this kind of shifting uh, like the, the wild, wild west uh, analogy you gave earlier. Um, you know, how, how do we as people in this sphere kind of influence how brands think about that? And um, the, the Twitter announcement to me is really interesting, particularly around uh, that freedom of speech uh, and, and you know, the difference between free speech and hate speech. And that's been such a you know a cultural um, hot button for for so many people, depending on you know regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum or otherwise. Um, but I like that you know there was a, a kind of a, a commonality around we need to think about where the people are, where the audience is, and you know this is emerging. Um, I think you know maybe some of you would or some people would say that it's emerging faster and uh, at, a, at a pace that we need to be ready for or adapting to now. Others maybe. We'll see. You know, the technology will catch up, and you know, we'll adapt to the technology kind of in a timely way. 
Um, but to bring it back to brand again, uh, the thing that I'm interested in is kind of what I was talking about earlier is this kind of loyalty or this uh, brand rationalization as to like what brands we choose. And uh, so I'm curious, I might start with you, Sean, and just ask this kind of last question is, um, you know, what, what has made you buy in the past from a certain brand or brands that you might be aspiring to or work towards? Um, and how do you think that's going to change in the future or, or, or do you think it will? Yeah, I mean, I think the same principles apply in Web3 as Web2 for brands, right? You make things people love, you know, make things people desire, solve problems, you know, respect your, your fans. These are some core values that will translate into the Web3 metaverse space as a brand. So I think the brands still need to continue to do that um, and be, be, have their ear to ground on what people want and don't want. So those are the core values I think that brands should be, be adhering to. What's made me buy? Um, again, you know, in the NFT space, I think it's utility. I, I collect art uh, and I'm, I, my wife's an artist and recently she's been in talks with a blockchain company who've opened up a marketplace and they're trying to talk about provenance, ownership, how do you associate a piece of digital art that's NFT to a, a physical piece of art? I think I'm interested in spaces where NFTs or the technology is trying to solve real world problems. Or Because if you think about the collectors of the next generation, the kids, our, my friend's kids, the kids of their kids, you know, they might be really comfortable saying that I'm, I'm okay with not putting out a piece of art on the wall. I, I'm okay with having a, a physical thing in my, my MetaMask wallet or on OpenSea or just a JPEG that's stored on IPFS, they might be okay with that. So we got to think about the changing taste of consumers as well, or what's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. I think the last thing that I bought was a, an NFT from, uh, do you guys know the rapper Lupe Fiasco? He's got, <laughs> uh, he dropped an NFT that said, hey, look, celebrating 15 years of, um, of my album, I've got an NFT that will give you a, a vinyl of my album that's signed. Uh, if you're in the area, you can get first dibs to free concert tickets and things like that. So I think that was interesting. You know, as a fan of his work, I bought it. It wasn't expensive. You know, I think it was like 0.1 ETH or something like that. And uh, what I did find it strange though, he didn't really promote it at the start. I think he had some concerns around, oh, what's my stance on critics who will say that NFTs are bad for the environment? So he took a very cautious approach. I dropped the project, but I can't really fully pimp out the project because I don't have an answer for critics. So that kind of stalled the project a little bit. So I think, again, it goes into, as a brand, when you're thinking about releasing a project, you got to think ahead about, okay, how do I address you know, concerns from, from different fronts, right? Whether it's cyberbullying to the environment, you know. So I think more broadly speaking to, you know, the consumer decision making process and how NFTs kind of interact with that. Um, I think, you know, with the acceleration of technology, you know, the world is only getting more fast paced, right? And so our attention spans are getting shorter due to social media algorithms and, you know, those Web2 platforms are becoming far more saturated. So Becoming top of mind during the purchase decision making process is only becoming more difficult. And I think when it comes to Web3 and the metaverse, I think it kind of presents an opportunity to create meaningful, immersive experiences that can help brands cut through the noise uh, in a sphere that's like largely untapped by competitors. Um, and I think if it's executed on well, it can really help foster meaningful connections. So um, to give you an example, uh, Mecca did a augmented reality filter with one of my favorite artists who also happens to be an NFT artist. Her name is Michaela Stafford. Um, and it was a really cool filter and it like, integrated well with Web3, right? And you could just go into store, like scan a QR code and this like immersive uh, augmented reality filter would show before you. Um, and because that experience, I was like, wow, you know, I'm going to give my dollars to Mecca. You know, this is a brand that kind of reflects on my own identity. And I think kind of hearkening to what Tim said about, you know, changing consumer tastes and everything like that. When people look at NFTs in the metaverse, you know, I understand why people can 
struggle to see the value in spending, you know, 148 on a board app. They're like, it's a digital file. Like it's a JPEG. You can write quick save it. It's just like effectively a certificate of authenticity on the blockchain, right? But what people don't realize is that there's a social uh, and community aspect as part of owning that NFT. You know, our digital lives are becoming more and more prominent. And when it comes to expressing our digital identity, you know, NFTs have become a big part of that, you know, and they've also become status symbols in part. And it's like, why buy, you know, spend X amount of dollars on a Louis Vuitton bag that people who I'm in public with, like a limited amount of people can see me in public with it, compared to the World Wide Web, where everyone can see me flex, flex my board age or what. So, yeah, consumer tastes are changing. Um, and I think, you know, with the acceleration of technology, it's also changing how consumers purchase and shop online. It's a really great way of framing it. And it's such a, um, I guess, I wonder if this is something that's going to change with generations or if there are people that are like me and sort of my age and kind of who are, it is a bit foreign to think about investing um, you know, money into something that is purely digital, where if you take uh, Tim used the example of his kids earlier and, you know, they were spending time on an avatar uh, to play a game and, and, you know, hours and hours and hours. And, you know, it's very easy to imagine that those people in that generation are, are like happily justifying expensive purchases on things that they can flex on their avatars or in that world. So the first thing my nephew said to me when he saw me the other day is I've got a new skin for my Fortnite character, how exciting. <laughs> and me trying to uh, share some level of enthusiasm <laughs> with him. And whilst I'm like, hey, should we play you know, guitar or do you want to do some drawing or something? <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, it's such a, uh, like, I've not heard anybody articulate it so clearly as that. It's like, you spend all this money on something that you can have in this world that only such a limited amount of people can experience with you versus, you know, this infinite, um, you know, audience that you could have in, in the virtual world or in the metaverse. It's a really, that's a, um, that's a big one. I think that's, a, that's, that's really well said and I find that quite interesting. The last thing, I guess, the idea of um, how we experience the world. So, you know, so in, in my practice day to day, uh, we're experienced designers and uh, I also work uh, as, a, as a filmmaker and, um, there's a quote I read a long time ago when I was first time to become an experience designer that filmmakers are the ultimate experience designers because uh, in any scene you have the opportunity to control how someone's thinking and feeling um, and you're really only playing to two sort of primal senses, so sight and sound. And so I always think about that when we're creating things where, you know, asking someone to um, imagine themselves uh, with a new brand or a new experience, you know, um, and, and how many of those senses are we tapping into? And typically, uh, the internet has been a predominantly visual medium, and now uh, we're getting to this point where we're augmenting that experience with things like mixed reality and augmented reality and virtual reality. And I'm curious, and I don't know that if any of you have the right answer, that's probably an impossible ask, mm -hmm. but I'm curious as to what you think this kind of combination of our sensory experience of the world, is there a new frontier in the, in the, the device element of how we experience the world, and, and is things like, or are things like a metaverse, or potentially brands, and we talked a little bit about Nike and um, and sneakers, uh, are the things that are, that are driving what we think might be the next wave of device or um, interaction with some of these new technologies, these new frontiers that we're talking about? I, I think with any new technology, I, I, I'm kind of a practical person. I want it to be a blend of great design and great utility, right? I won't use an AVR headset, headset because it's clunky. I'm not going to sit there with this thing, you know, straining my neck for 10 hours on end. A smartphone's great because it fits in your pocket and you can do so much with it. You know, as long as the technology evolves to a point where, I'm not saying there's no place for vanity, but yeah, you know, I'm sure that, that, you know, AR filters that make funny faces of animals have their place in the world, but you know, again, if you create a piece of technology for me, I want it to do something that's useful for my life, you know, change my life or make things easier, better, faster, simpler. Uh, you know, whether that's pay for, whether in the space of payments, connecting with friends um, or doing a task. Yeah, so that's what I look for in technology when I 
buy something. Yeah. What about you, Tim? Any any predictions? Smart speakers. Like I, I think smart speakers, they seem a little bit, you know, they've been around for a while, but actually they, they've had a steady, steady growth. What you're starting to find, I think, is with the streaming services, you're starting to see the content become more relevant for smart speakers. And what's happening is, is that we, there's growth in, in that channel, um, which isn't cannibalizing the other traditional channels of radio or um, uh, podcasts and that sort of thing. And you're even finding that that listening patterns on smart speakers is different to people who use their device, right? Because of the smartphone, because smartphone, you, it's generally mobility. You're 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 out and about. Where whereas smart speakers at home, you'll you'll listen to more long form content. Um, I, I think you will see a real change in the usage of of audio in, in the next five years, and and that's even that's evolving with things like three D audio and, and it, it's innovating as well. I think you'll see more content becoming, um, you know, crafted more specifically for the device you're using. It's really, I think that's that'll be, it won't be the next frontier, but I think like streaming in, in sort of linear TV, you'll start to see audio really evolve over the next sort of few years. Yeah, I think nobody would have necessarily predicted the success and the rise of podcasts as being such a hugely, you know, consumed global phenomenon. Like, it's a, you know, to see, so that's another sense, I guess, if you think about Web 2.0 being predominantly visual, um, Web 3, um, is it potentially going to have more audio? You know, is that going to be more based around um, immersive um, audio experiences or, or different kinds of content? So, I don't know. Um, I was hoping that one of you would say that one of the other senses, like tastes, like, you know, oh, there's this prediction that, you know, uh, Tasty or, you know, BuzzFeed Tasty is like hugely popular. Someone's just like on the precipice of making it so you can scroll and taste. <laughs> and that would have been mic drop moment for me. So, well, the um, technology exists, right? There's, you know, comments, really? <laughs> That's comments, what I was you go into a, 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 and watch a 3D show, they try to make it 4D by spraying water at you and things like that. Yeah. So how do you <laughs> bring that into virtual space senses. I think it will be very dependent on industry. And I guess collectively, it seems like we're all predicting that there is an increased appetite for virtual or augmented experiences, maybe at different rates, but, and, you know, for different contexts, but, um, you know, that, that is happening, right? We are moving towards a world where we are spending more and more time in either an augmented experience or a virtual experience. Have you ever found um, examples of brands where it's maybe not right for them or you think, you know, maybe it's not the right timing or their product or their value proposition doesn't necessarily align with what Web3 or, you know, uh, in cryptocurrency can, can offer them? Um, no. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any standard where I've been like, this just makes absolutely no sense. Uh, there has been okay. a few examples where the execution of the Web3 strategy wasn't done so well. So for example, there was a Metaverse Fashion Week recently in Decentraland, which is like um, an NFT uh, gaming uh, project. And basically, I think several brands like uh, Estee Lauder, um, Dolce & Cabana did this like virtual fashion show in the Metaverse. and whilst people kind of applauded them for their vision and experimenting with something new, uh, ultimately the execution wasn't that good. Um, but I think, yeah, I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head where there's been a blatant, like incongruous uh, example of a brand that just shouldn't have pivoted into NFTs. That's great, great examples as well. Like the, the I didn't know there was Metaverse Fashion Week. That's, uh, that's cool, I like that. <laughs> okay, um, so from my perspective, that's probably pretty much the, the last of what I wanted to discuss. I really appreciate you all kind of taking my long-winded questions and, and answering them so well. Um, is there anything that in your preparation or kind of just thinking about the context of the conversation that you thought might be worth 
um, sharing with us and with our audience and you wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking to? Uh, I think what's really, I want to go back to what I said at the start about brands needing to be open and to embrace technology and to maybe even be a bit bold and carve out some resources to explore a little mini fun project team that can explore new territories, give give your give the stakeholders or decision makers a little bit of flex to kind of explore new spaces and, and, and find partners like agencies or or even partnerships with cryptocurrency exchanges and technologists, you know, work with people outside your usual comfort zone, artists, technologists, futurists, um, developers, you know, put yourself out there. And I think you end up getting a better result because they'll open sort of your mind to what to, to new things that are possible in the space. Yeah, um, while there is a lot of hype surrounding Web3 and the metaverse, and I think this innovative channel presents a lot of opportunities to marketers, I think ultimately creating a Web3 strategy depends on your brand strategy and your objectives, right? So are your customers digital natives? Are you B2B or B2C? Um, does Implementing the Web3 strategy align with your values and your goals. Uh, what kind of experiences are you trying to create? And more importantly, do you have the resources to execute well? Um, I think Web3 is about narrative and storytelling, not just in terms of the world that you're trying to build, but also how your project kind of aligns with the narratives around identity that your consumers tell themselves. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate you all sharing. And, um, you know, it's a bit of a, I guess, a, an unusual request to, to join a panel to speak about something when your fellow uh, panel members are potentially from very different industries and very different points of view. And um, it was perhaps a little bit kind of ambitious when we thought about doing this kind of counterpoint discussion around um, you know, does this really matter? <laughs> Should we be talking about this? Do our our clients and do brands, you know, need to give space for, for what's coming down the pipe, and or or in some cases, what's already here? Uh, and and I, I definitely feel like I learned a lot from from all of you. So I appreciate you uh, illuminating some of these subjects for me. Um, in some cases, uh, particularly you, Tim, reinforcing that perhaps some of the ways I feel are, are not, you know, so unusual, and you know, it's not. Um, it's not necessarily right or wrong. It just depends. It depends. You know, where are you? Are you open-minded to it? Um, and are you willing to stay the course and ensure that the execution of the vision sort of matches up with the promise of what the technology can do today and potentially will do in the future, including tasty BuzzFeed with uh, the full sensory experience, which is... <laughs> so thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And for those who are tuning in or watching this at a later stage, we appreciate you... Uh, staying and, and hearing out the thoughts of our panel speakers. Uh, again, uh, Natalie, Tim, Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure having this conversation with you and appreciate your time. Uh, don't forget, we do this every last Friday of the month. So please like and subscribe uh, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks again. Bye.